let's continue our discussion further and um, let's try to calculate some physical observables in the FIFOR theory and see what we get. So let's say we try to calculate um, um, a physical mass of the particles in this theory okay, and see what happens. So you remember that the action in FIFOR theory is integral d4x half del mu phi del mu phi minus half m square phi square minus lambda over 4 factorial phi to the 4. Okay, um, where m is some mass parameter. So if I want to calculate physical mass, that physical mass will be expressed in terms of these parameters m square and lambda. That we call all, all observables will be functions of these parameters that appear in the action. So the physical mass, which we have been calling mp, will be a function of m and lambda. And um, so let's see. So I should look at two-point function and find out where the pole of this two-point function is. And you remember that the location of the pole is the physical mass. Okay. So to lowest order is this propagator, which is just i over p square minus m square. So m physical to lowest order is just m. Okay. Now we want the effects of quantum field theory in, in finding out what the physical mass is because this prediction is prediction based on a free theory, right? Because we have not included any interactions. This is a simple propagator which doesn't include any interactions. So let's include interactions. And then you have this term. Okay, so I have to calculate this loop and then take into account its contribution. Okay, and then we have these other diagrams as well. We have seen this um, earlier in this course or maybe in the previous course, I don't remember where we did. And there are all these, these diagrams, right? We have to sum up all of these, the infinite of them. And we have already seen that such integrals diverge. So if you take this one, it will give you d4l, where l is the loop momentum. Let me draw this clearly. I assign the momentum this way. Momentum, external momentum P is entering. But you see at this, at this point when it enters, okay, it's, it's, there is no uh, external momentum that enters into this propagator, right? Because you have written down L for the loop momentum and momentum conservation doesn't allow any, anything else into entering into the loop because whatever enters in exits here. So you see here is L going out and at this vertex from this side L is entering. Okay, so momentum conservation says that P cannot enter into the loop, okay? This is very special for these kind of vertices. Anyhow, so you have one over L square minus M square plus epsilon, okay? And as I was saying last time, if you look at, you have four powers of L in the numerator and two powers in the denominator, so this diverges. Okay, I'll show you, as I promised, that I'll show you uh, how to do it properly, but you, you roughly see that this is divergent, okay? And uh, this is the situation at one loop. Okay. The diagram, which is this, diverges. Let's see what happens at two loops. You have all these, this diagram, this diagram and others. So let's uh, look at this one. 
Okay, I'm just doing it so that we get some practice with uh, these Feynman diagrams so that the later discussion becomes a little easier. So again, you have P entering. Okay, this is two loops, so you have two assignments of momenta. Let's call it L1. L1 enters here. L2 enters, uh, L2 uh, flows this, this way. So you have L1 plus L2 plus P in this propagator. Okay, and then of course P comes out. So this will, what will be the expression? It will have, first of all, because it's two loop, meaning you have two um, um, loop momenta, L1 and L2. Okay, convince yourself that you cannot have only one loop momentum here. It will not work out. And you will need two loop momentum, two undetermined loop momentum. So, but, but that, is, that is something you should check that it cannot work without having two loop momenta. So D4L1, D4L2, and then you have all these propagators. L1 square minus M square plus I epsilon, and then you have um, 1 over L2 square minus M square plus I epsilon. Then you have L1 plus L2 plus P square minus M square plus I epsilon. Okay, I'm not being careful with the overall factors. I'm just writing the important parts. So you see this one is also divergent. Mm -hmm. You have two powers from this factor two powers of L from this factor and two powers from this. So when all these L's are large, this will provide six powers of L. You can forget about these external momentum P and M because they do not, um, they are of no importance when L is very large, L1 and L2 are very large. So you see eight powers in the numerator and six powers in the denominator. So this will diverge. Okay, and going to any other loop, the same situation, you will see that these are all divergent in ultraviolet. V I O L E T. Okay, this statement means that when you take large momenta, this is divergent. This is also called as ultraviolet divergence. So you see that if you try to calculate this uh, two-point function to extract what the physical mass is, you, you don't get anything, okay? Because all these corrections are infinite. They are all divergent. So there is no prediction coming out from your, um, from your theory. Okay, so even though this is um, very bad situation, it's hopeless, but just because I am drawing some diagrams and writing down some expressions, let's continue that and uh, even without any good motivation for this, I will just draw some diagrams and see what happens, okay, what kind of diagrams there are, okay. Later that information will be useful. Okay, how about three-point function? So I saw that two-point function is ultraviolet divergent. How about three-point function in 5-4 theory? Okay, if you, if you remember, or uh, maybe you can see now itself that such uh, Green's functions or such diagrams you cannot draw in 5-4 theory because you have a vertex which has four lines attached to it. So you'll never be able to draw any diagrams which has odd number of external lines. Okay, so this is out anyway. Let's go to four-point function now. So, you have um, okay. 
So this will be plus this is one loop and we have drawn already um, several times such diagrams. Let me draw them again and then you have I always find this drawing this last one confusing. Okay, so that's at one loop. I mean, you also have these ones and others. But uh, these ones I will not consider because when we were calculating um, S matrix, we saw that this after LSZ reduction was done, I could express the, the S matrix in terms of amputated Green's functions. So I will not include this one, I will include only the ones without any external corrections. Okay, and the, all the external corrections were um, in, the, in the Z functions or wave function renormalization constants. Okay, so let's see what we get here. Let's look at this one. So I will draw it again. P1 P2, okay, let me tell you that here these moments are like this. So P1, P2, P3, P4 and in this one also it's the same assignment. Because if you change the momentum assignments then your diagrams will look different. Okay, I can just um, also draw all these three diagrams in exactly the same manner and change the places where P1, P2, P3, P4 appear. Okay, and then the all diagrams will look the same. So what I'm saying is if you take this one, here P1, P2, P3, P4, let's say you change the labels here instead of P1, you make, um, let's say, P3. So this one if you change to P3 and this one to P2, P2, P3, then it is this diagram. Right? Because at this vertex, P1 and P3 are meeting. Okay? And at the other vertex, P2 and P4 are meeting. And that is what you'll get if you were to make this an, um, assignment. So then at this vertex, P2 and, sorry, I, I should have said not this way, but here P3 and here P2. Then it would be P1 and P3 meeting at this vertex, which is what is here, P1 and P3 meeting at this vertex. And then P3 and P4 meeting uh, P3 and P2 meeting at this vertex, which is what is here, P2 and, sorry, <laughs> um, uh, this is P3 and then this should be P2, I'm repeatedly making mistakes because this I leave as P4, so then P2 and P4 meet, which is here, okay. So either you can choose to draw these diagrams like the way I have drawn or draw the same diagram repeatedly, but change the uh, external momentum positions. But it's more convenient if you draw it this way. Anyhow, so at this vertex, P1 and P2 enter, okay? So the total momentum that is in injected at this vertex is P1 plus P2. Let's call it P. So I define it P as P1 plus P2. That is what enters in here. Okay, and then you have a loop momentum L, which I want to choose this way. Then you have L plus P flowing this way. Okay, and again, let's write down the integral. It's D4L, 1 over L square minus M square plus I epsilon. And then you have 1 over L plus P whole square minus M square plus I epsilon. So this is also divergent. Four powers in the denominator and four powers in the numerator. And this is a divergent quantity, okay? As you can see by this power counting, okay? This will, if you were to put a cutoff lambda, it will diverge logarithmically. Okay, so no surprising, this is also bad. But um, let's 
move further ahead and draw a few more diagrams. So I have looked at already two point function and four point function and found that they are all diverging at one loop order. Let's look at six point function now. Okay, so you have some of these two momenta, let's call it P1, it enters here. Some of these two, let's call it P2, that enters at this vertex. And the sum of these two, let's call it P3, and it is injected into the diagram at this vertex. Okay, and let's assign momentum L like this, then it becomes L plus P1, this becomes L plus P2 and this is anyway L plus P3. Okay, so let's write down the expression or at least the integral D4L, it's one loop, so only one loop momentum, one over L square minus M square plus I epsilon, one over L plus P1 square plus I epsilon, Okay, so we have three den denominators because we have three propagators. Each brings a power of two. Okay, so we have a total power six in the denominator and in the numerator you have four powers. Okay, so this is ultraviolet convergent because the, the function is falling sufficiently fast that in the limit uh, L going to infinity, this converges. Okay, it doesn't diverge. So, Good for us, at least one diagram is uh, finite, but that's not going to change anything because we still cannot determine um, masses, um, physical masses in this theory, or even four point uh, scattering function. I mean, suppose you are looking at a cross section calculation of two particles scattering to two particles, you cannot calculate it because it's it will come out to be infinite. Okay, because these diagrams are divergent. Okay, you might think that if you were to calculate two particles, let's say this and this, going to four particles. Okay, one, two, three, four. This will come out to be finite. Okay, because this diagram is finite. So lowest order diagram you can, can draw like this. Two, I hope I can find... Uh, Yeah, this one. So if, let's say this one is, these two are incoming, and these one, two, three, four, these four are outgoing, then this is three level diagram, there are no ultraviolet divergences because there are no loops involved. So you can calculate this one, and then you look at this one loop, which has turned out to be ultraviolet finite. So it looks like you can calculate, um, um, two going to four scattering, okay, that's scattering uh, matrix element, and that will come out to be finite. And if you were to calculate cross-section for two going to four scattering, you might naively think from this that it will come out to be finite. Okay, but that's not the case. Uh, and let's see why. And the reason is the following. So let's Take this one again, which is convergent. And you understand why it's convergent, because now you have larger number of denominators. See, the numerator power is still fixed. It's D4L, so four powers in the numerator. And what we have done is our uh, increase the number of denominators by going to <clears throat> uh, more number of external lines, so that the number of denominators has increased and it brings six power, so it, it is converging. But now, when you are calculating cross-section for two going to four scattering, this diagram will also contribute, okay? But now this is, is this convergent? <clears throat> well, you might think that this is convergent because you have one, two, three, four, 
and five, five propagators. So that brings a that brings ten powers of L in the denominator. in the Feynman integral. And you have four powers in the, sorry, not four. You have, so this is how many loops? This is two loop. And you see one loop here, one loop here. Or you can just try to also check the momentum assignment. So this is loop. Momentum, it goes here. It's determined by uh, whatever momentum comes in from here, that adds up. Let me write it P1. So it is L plus P1. P2 enters here. So this is L plus P2. But at this vertex, this momentum you cannot fix. right? Because you have three lines going from here. So one momentum enters, and you have one, two, and three lines. You cannot fix momentum in all the three lines. So let's assign this one as L2. Okay, L2 flows in like this. And now this one is determined. Okay. And then you have this and yeah, and this one more propagator. So you have 10 powers of L. And how many powers in the numerator? You have D4 L1, D4 L2. Let's call it L1. Let's call it L2. Okay, so eight powers. So naively, it looks like this will be convergent, right? Because you have um, more powers in the denominator compared to the number of powers in the numerator. But then when you are doing this integral, okay, this, uh, see here, let me just write here, it is L1 plus P2 in this. Yeah, because this, this cannot change the momentum that has, uh, that is going out. It will just be the same. So you will have D4 L1, let me write it down, D4 L1, and then all these propagators, which have only L1, and then this one, D4 L2, and this will be 1 over L2 square minus M square plus I epsilon. Okay, somehow it has stopped working. Okay, so this, um, um, now look at this one. Even though the way we are counting it looks like it's finite, but if you look at this piece, which is multiplied here, this is ultraviolet divergent, right? We have already seen this because this is ultraviolet divergent. So you have a divergent piece in here, and this is called a subdivergence. Okay, so the diagram looks like, if you do just a power counting, it looks like um, UV finite, but it has a subdivergence sitting in it. This is UV divergent part. So our hope of getting uh, two going to four scattering as a finite thing in um, in in this five four theory, even that is gone. So there's nothing that we can really calculate in this theory if we were to proceed um, the way we have set up things right now. Okay, so. So what should we do next? And what's the, and you already know that people do quantum field theory and they get predictions for uh, scattering cross sections at these uh, different machines that we have built over time like large electron positron collider or, or Tevatron or LHC. So clearly uh, we can get uh, some finite results. Okay, and um, the things, the thing that makes it possible to have finite predictions from this theory is called renormalization. 
So this program of um, getting finite results out of a perturbation theory which is seemingly divergent, I mean it, it's, it's each element is diverging in ultraviolet, okay, this, that program is called renormalization. So, um, there are two steps involved in this. The step number one is to introduce a regulator, okay, whose job is to make the integrals finite. So you introduce a regulator, the, the integral then depends on that regulator, it becomes a function of that regulator. And the purpose of that regulator is to make the integral finite, okay, in, in ultraviolet. But of course, if you were to remove the regulator, it will become divergent again, and we need to remove the regulator. So, introduce a regulator to make the integrals UV finite finite okay and this procedure is called regularization for example we have already seen one example okay too many examples in the same sentence not nice. Um, so one one regulation one regularization uh, method we have seen and that is cutoff. Okay. So here you introduce a cutoff and say that I will cut off the integrals at some momentum value high momentum value lambda. Okay. So now your integrals will depend on this cutoff, right? Because there is lambda. But our real thing is when lambda goes to infinity. So at the end, I have to take lambda going to infinity. So it looks like this is not going to help, which is true. Having just a regulator is not going to help. Something else has to uh, do the magic so that we get finite results. Okay, and that, that magic is called uh, renormalization. And I will, I will tell you in more detail how that thing works. So the idea is you, um, you introduce this cutoff and calculate whatever observable you want to calculate with the cutoff in place. And your result will depend on the cutoff. Okay? But we'll see that we can um, arrange things in a manner that this um, that these divergences which are appearing, which will appear as function of lambda, right? Because lambda is to filter out um, the divergences. So within that observable, we will be able to cancel the ultraviolet divergences. So all the divergences which are functions of lambda, they will cancel. And then once the divergences have canceled, we are free to take lambda going to infinity. Okay, and our, and our result will still remain finite. Okay, and that is what is called um, uh, renormalization. Okay, this, this procedure of uh, subtracting infinities. So I will um, talk about different ways, uh, different methods of regularization first and then we'll move on to renormalization. But here's something I want to point out based on what we have already seen here. So how many parameters do we have in this action? We have two parameters, m and lambda, okay? And let's look at one loop. We'll worry about higher loops later, but if you look at one loop, then this two point function is divergent because of this diagram. Okay, that's one diagram which is divergent at uh, 
or one uh, two point green function which is divergent at one loop then you have um, another one where did that go here this one four point function which is also divergent at one loop right so you have two greens functions which are divergent at one loop but when we went to higher order uh, greens functions like this one this is not divergent at one loop right this one is not divergent and you can imagine drawing other one loop diagrams that will be just introducing uh, more uh, vertices so you get higher point functions and they will also not be divergent so two greens functions which are divergent and one at one loop and you have two um, parameters m and lambda in the theory which no which are not physical quantities so you never measure m you never measure lambda these are not physical objects right what you measure is a physical mass you can measure the mass of an electron okay or you can measure the strength of uh, the interaction of one electron with another electron okay these are the things you can measure you can measure cross sections but there is nothing you can do to measure m and lambda so right now the situation is that you have two parameters which are not measurable and you have two greens functions at one loop which are divergent and what one does in is hides these infinities which you are seeing at one loop um uh, in these two parameters okay and then you can get a result that is finite up to one loop okay and we'll see how this can also uh how why this will work at uh, uh two similar things will work at two loop also but roughly that is the thing and i will tell you in detail later how to uh do these steps to get a finite cross section but before that i want to um yeah i want to look at the ultraviolet divergences in all in all these feynman diagrams a bit more carefully as i have been saying repeatedly that i will do it later so now let's do that part and uh we can um see that ultraviolet divergences become very transparent if we do to go to um uh, if if we do a wick rotation both in the loop momentum and the external momentum okay so that's what i'm going to do and um uh when we go to the physical external momentum okay so we have gone to um, i'm saying these steps let me remind you just a second yeah here for example or or even earlier here so when we were doing this integral we had gone to uh, p square um, which was the external momentum p square that small p square we made it space like which is not the physical region okay which you can also do by taking the zeroth component of p to be imaginary okay then p square will become negative and here we had done a wick rotation so that we got this um denominator okay this integral was well defined here it is um once you have done this here it is easy to see the ultraviolet divergence because now everything is adding up it's not unlike the previous case where k0 square minus k vector square you had a minus sign and um no it's not so uh, clear what kind of divergences you are getting okay because if if you take all k0 and 
k1 k2 k3 all to be of the same order then you can get cancellations between k0 square minus these other terms okay so uh, but here it is all very clean because uh, there is no cancellation between different components so here you you see that in this case you have two powers in the numerator so both k1 and k2 are large let's say uh, you put a cutoff lambda so for both of them you have a cutoff lambda so two powers here and then you have two powers here and that square okay so four and two here so this is convergent and this is convergent because we had gone to two dimensions right this integral we evaluated in two dimensions so that's what we want to do again and the lesson from here i'm, I'm going to rewrite this thing okay in the following following way Okay, as I said, I will take the external momenta, which are PIs, okay, and I will rotate them. Okay, I'm thinking of doing integrals in n dimension. Okay, for at this moment, it's not clear why I'm doing this, why I want to be in n dimensions. Okay, but let's let's say that for for whatever reasons I want to work instead of four in n dimensions. Okay, but if you don't like it, you can put n equal to four. There is no nothing is going to change uh, in the in the reasoning. Okay, so um, this and also the loop momenta we had done this. Okay, so that's the weak rotation. And we just saw that thing in the red box that if you look at this two point function and do the integral, okay, then it is of the following form integral 0 to 1 dx, integral, so that was two dimensions, but I'm saying n dimensions now, and then that was in the Euclidean space. So I call them, call the, uh, the, uh, the the loop momentum vector as k e for the Euclidean. Okay, and here similarly you will have two pi to the n, and this vector of minus k e square minus m square whole square. Let's go back and check whether indeed we have the same form. Here you see, this is, so let's bring the minus sign inside. I had taken it out, but let's put it back. So there's square, so that minus go in, goes in here and it multiplies everything. Okay, so it is minus of this square minus that square, which is minus of k Euclidean square, that's the definition. Then minus, this object is positive, so minus of a positive object because x is positive and 1 minus x will always be positive because x lies between 0 and 1 and p square was space like okay because it is weak rotated and that is what we are so this is minus this positive object minus m square okay because of that minus sign so it becomes negative of a positive quantity and that is what i am writing as capital m square okay so that's the form and I have dropped I epsilon because there is no need for it when we are in the Euclidean space. Okay, and here m square is a function of x, p square and m square. 
now uh, we can very cleanly see what is the uh, degree of divergence so i have um, this integral see the x integrals are not going to give you any um, ultraviolet divergence they run from 0 to 1 they don't go to infinity okay so that's not going to give ultraviolet divergences they give rise to something called infrared divergences but right now we are not concerned with any infrared divergences okay infrared uh, or collinear divergences they give in theories where we have massless particles but uh, they cannot give rise to any ultraviolet divergences okay so ultraviolet divergences are completely contained in this and as i said that going to the physical um, external momenta okay and going back to the real axis that is not going to generate any ultraviolet divergences any additional things so whatever ultraviolet divergence is contained in these weak rotated integrals is the real ultraviolet divergence okay and that's why i am showing you these integrals so from here now we can estimate um what is the degree of divergence okay so uh, i hope it is clear but if it if not then you should do a radial integral and an angular integral okay the, this is um, this is a vector ke in n dimensional euclidean space for example n could be 2 so it's a vector ke in this two dimensional space okay you can do integral by integrating this way so as you go out you are integrating over the the radius or the magnitude of the vector r and the other integral will involve integrating over ang angle which is theta okay so these two integrals are in theta and the generalization of this for n dimensions you have to do now angular integrals do not give any divergence any ultraviolet divergence okay the, these angular integrals have um, finite volume like here it is theta goes from 0 to 2 pi okay that's something finite if it was sphere then the solid angle will be 4 pi and so forth that doesn't give you any infinity okay what gives you infinity is because this radius goes to infinity okay so that is the source so we can just forget about the angular integrals also and just worry about the radial integral okay so suppressing the angular part let's look at the radial part so radial part will be integral 0 to infinity okay you will have r to the n minus 1 dr and that makes uh, n powers of momenta right dr has one power of uh, momentum and r power n minus 1 has n minus 1 powers so together n powers and this is anyway minus r square power 2 i have dropped m square because m square is something finite right p square you have chosen um, that's something given to you by your process okay m square is finite this is finite x ranges from 0 to 1 that's finite so as r becomes large m square you can drop in comparison with large r okay and then you see the divergence is like this if when n minus 1 yeah so you um i hope everything is yeah we are doing for this specific integral so when um n minus 1 minus 
4 okay is for here and minus 4 should be less than 1. Okay, because n minus 1 minus 4, let us say if it is equal to 1, uh, no, not 1, no, should be less than minus 1. So, if n minus 1 minus 4 is, let us say, 0, okay, let us say 0, then you have. Um, what am I doing? Dr zero. Yeah, then it is divergent, right? Because then you have just integral dr. Okay, because uh, there will be no power of r coming from this because then minus one minus four is zero. Okay, so that will be divergent. Um, then e even if you had a power of r in the denominator, which is r minus one that would also be divergent and that is why n minus 1 minus 4 uh, should be less than minus 1 okay or n minus should be less than minus 1 okay so this is fine then what next yeah then we have also uh, looked at the uh, general multi loop di integral earlier which is here right that's the let me remind you So we were looking at this Feynman integral and you see here we had n propagators that, and for each propagator we had nx1, nxi. So that is why you have n number of um, uh, Feynman parameters and that's the delta function. I think this is something I inserted today, I had forgotten in the previous, previous video. And then you had this denominator, okay, and these are the loop momenta which are still in the Minkowski space. Then I did a Wick rotation, okay? And after doing a Wick rotation, the, this is the denominator, where L0, you see here, Li0 the, uh, is Lin times e to the i pi by 2, which is i, right? So here, that's the denominator, where here I should put a um, e to the 2i pi by 2, okay, which is going to give you minus 1. Okay. And I had suppressed the labels on x. So this is what we had in the denominator. Okay, so let's look at this one and try to uh, carefully um, uh, find out the degree of divergence for such diagrams, okay? And uh, this time I'm doing properly in the Euclidean space. Just like for this diagram. So, uh, uh, power counting for for general multi-loop integral or Feynman diagram. So let me remind you about the notation. L stands for the number of loops 
we still want to work in n dimensions. We will see later why, but for now it doesn't matter. Okay, so instead of four dimensions, I am working in n dimensions. So for now you can imagine that the universe you live in has more than four dimensions, which is of course not true, but we can imagine. And n is the number of propagators. Okay, which is same as the number of Feynman parameters. Okay, and after doing weak rotation of both the physical and loop momenta, sorry, not physical, let's call it external. You can call it physical also, and loop momenta, loop momenta, moment, not momenta, momenta. Um, we had found the following. Okay, I'll drop these factors of i, pi, and n minus one factorial or gamma n, what we had earlier, and just concentrate on the. Uh, on the important part. Okay. Should I go to the next page? Or maybe not. So we had, let me keep gamma n, which is n minus one factorial. So we had this following, we had dx1 up to dxn, then you have a delta function which constrains all these um, Feynman parameters such that the sum is one. Okay. Then after doing weak rotation, our loop integral momenta, uh, loop momenta are like this. So L1 for loop number one, um, this N, and you remember what this is, right? This is L0 when you take the zeroth component of L1 and you do weak rotation, that is what you are call calling Ln. And then these are the remaining spatial components, which is N minus one dimensional. Or this is not a good notation. And the limits are from minus infinity to plus infinity. We have L loop momenta, so L n d n minus one l l okay then it stopped working then here is the denominator and the denominator is this minus x1 k1 square I will I will tell you what I am doing first let me write down x2 k2 square x n k n square minus m square okay and I don't put any i epsilon because I'm already in the Euclidean space you don't need i epsilons there okay because there is a definite sign here okay and what is 
x1, x2, so forth. Um, sorry, k1, k2. So k, q, q runs from one to one to um, no, that's not k n. What is that's the number of um, propagators and the number of propagators I'm saying cap, uh, capital N. So this should be capital N. Right, you have for each propagator you have one uh, x. So we have we should have x1 up to x capital N. Okay, let's say q is that index which labels this 1, 2, 3. So kq square is this. kq 1 square. There's the first spatial component of k. kq 2 square. Or maybe I'll put this. Otherwise it's confusing. K Q K Q um, we are working in n dimensions n minus one square and then the zeroth component after week rotation we have, were writing it as we are right uh, okay K Q n that was on rotation. That was for the loop momentum. And um, I'm using the same notation for Q because K and L are related. So this is in Euclidean space. You see all the signs are plus. There is no minus sign entering anywhere. And uh, KQ is the following. The vector KQ is uh, L. But that's the vector KQ. Okay, I'll just remove this arrow is alpha i q l i summation from i equal to 1 to i runs from 1 to what it should run from 1 to the number of loop momenta right so that's what you're adding so 1 to l plus summation over j um, beta j q beta q j and then you have p j okay, and this is what is p j j runs from 1 to the number of external momenta external lines e so that's the definition okay, all I have done is this define let's go back here here so you see here um, the indices on x is suppressed but this is this is going giving you a factor of minus 1 so that comes out here, minus sign sits here. So you have minus of, and this minus also, let's pull out those both minus signs and just keep them aside for a moment. Then you have only plus signs relative to them. So you have um, x times this square minus x times this square. Okay, and this momentum, this entire thing, alpha li plus beta j p j, the sum of all these momenta I'm calling k. Okay, so this becomes x times k square. This plus this becomes x times k square and there is an overall minus n and that is what I have written here. Okay, so x times k square or for x1 we have k1 square, x2 k2 square. And what is x1 and x2? These are just the, sorry, what are k1 and k2? These are just the momenta that are flowing in these propagators. So propagator number one has this momentum flowing in it. Okay, I, ho I hope you remember. See, whatever momentum flows, let me show you one of the diagrams. It will be easier to... Um, okay.
Okay, let's see if I can find. Yeah, here for example. If you look at the the propagators, okay, this will have L1 plus P1 whole square. So it is both linear in the loop momentum and the external momentum. The K, the, the corresponding K here, this is what I'm calling K1 or K2 or whatever. These are the Ks. Okay, so this, um, this is both linear in loop and the external momenta. If you go to any of these, you will have loop momenta uh, summing up, adding up linearly and also the external momenta will be adding up linearly. Signs may be plus or minus, but they will be all linear. Okay, And this is exactly what I have written in the general case. And this will be true for whatever diagram you draw. Okay, this is the sum of all L's with either coefficient plus one, minus one or zero. So L1 plus L2 minus L3 minus L4, whatever. And similarly here, PJs with all, um, uh, uh, all of the PJs with some of the betas could be zero, some of the betas could be one or minus one. Okay, so that, that's a plus, not a minus. Okay, so now we have this integral. We are almost uh, almost there, and we can just to remind you what we are trying to do. We are trying to achieve equivalent of equivalent of this, okay, so that I can do the power counting. Okay. Okay, good then. Um, now, because each of the case is linear in L, the loop momenta. Okay, and because we have a square, it becomes quadratic in in allies. Okay, so this um, this thing here in the curly brackets is quadratic in allies. Okay, so I will just write down the most general form a quadratic function can take. So denominator is quadratic function of Li over capital N. And we are looking at this. So as I said, the degree of this thing is two. Sorry, it's a quadratic. I will write down what it looks like then. So it will have a degree two term. And what will be the degree two term? It will be L i L j, right? It will be multiplying L1, L2, L1 square, L2 square, L1, L3, L4, L3, like this. And there'll be some coefficients. There's Einstein summation convention, which I'm using. So it is, for example, A1, Three L one L three. This is one of the terms plus a one one L one square and so forth. Um, then let's look at the degree two term. Sorry, degree one term. It will have the form L i some constant b i. So this is b one L one plus b two L two and so forth okay and these bi's are functions of um, stop writing i'm unable to write now so all uh, let's call it j here j all the external momenta and all the Feynman parameters, right? So Bs will depend on that. You can see from here, here, K1, 
kq has b okay and there are also x's multiplying here so when you are looking at the sum of these k squares multiplying these x's the linear terms will also have these uh, these uh, p's entering them in them and uh, multiplying them and also the x's and that is why i am writing b is a function of x and p uh, if you are not fully confident then you can write down a diagram with three propagators okay and uh, a few propagators and two loops and draw explicitly and then you will see or or just do this from here you will see okay and then degree zero term which is the constant term i'll call it c okay this will also be a function of these um, m square and external momenta okay so what's there is nothing else right we have exhausted all the possibilities so a quadratic function can only be a function of will will have a degree 2 term degree 1 term degree 0 term there is nothing else so the denominator is of the following form okay now you see aij is a real symmetric matrix okay it is multiplying li lj which is symmetric so aij is also symmetric okay it's a real symmetric matrix which can be diagonalized okay and um, um furthermore none of the eigen values will be zero okay so it's a positive definite matrix and uh, you know because you have l uh, loop momentum is l it's not going to be something which involves lower number of loop moment after diagonalization so um, this is a positive definite matrix and all the eigen values will be uh, non zero okay and then after diagonalization i can write it as um ai prime li prime square bi prime li prime plus constant okay when i when i look at this this thing so basically i'm doing an orthogonal transformation so li's go to li primes and these coefficients will change of course so this is the linear term this term will because we are trying to diagonalize this one by an orthogonal transformation this is the diagonal form and these are the coefficients multiplying each of the li's and then this is a constant term okay now you can uh, do another thing you can see going from li to li prime the the measure will not pick up any jacobian because this is orthogonal okay and determinant uh, of this or uh, this uh, matrices will be one the trans uh, the, the the transformation matrices but then you can do one more step you can absorb these ai's into um into these ali so you define a new ali which absorbs that so these these terms these um, quadratic terms come with power 1 each term okay and this will of course then change and the constant will also change and then you do a uh, then you complete the square okay that is exactly the same step as we had done long back somewhere here here how did we reach here we did re we reached here by completing a square here this step okay and then we had to shift the momentum so after you have completed the square okay so this is a loop momentum and that's uh what you get after completing the square so you do this similar step and then you shift the momentum okay 
and that's what you should do here as well so i leave it as an exercise for you to do okay so exercise complete the square okay after you have divided by after you have gotten rid of these coefficients by redefining and then you shift the momentum shift the loop momentum okay and it will give you the following so that's an exercise you should check apart from some other factors which i am not writing you will get the following 0 to 1 dx1 0 to 1 dx um n number of propagators delta of x1 plus x2 plus x n minus 1 times um integral d l1 and i hope i'm not changing the notation yes correct then d l1 dn dn minus 1 l1 over 2 pi to the n did i write 2 pi to the n earlier i forgot so here i should have written 2 pi to the n okay and for each loop momentum you have this dl um l because you have l loop momenta l okay so over 2 pi to the n good and then you should uh check that this is the result that you are going to get times 1 over i have uh, renamed the loop momenta again to l okay l1 l2 so i'm writing the result um, because anyway l is dummy so i'm writing it this way square minus capital m square i epsilon has been dropped power n okay check this that this is what you get where m square is of course a function of um m square is a function so it's not writing now the function of x size then it will be function of pi dot pj and it will be a function of m square okay these are the things which will enter m square okay and now uh, this is looking very good i'll just write one more step so this l1 square plus l2 square plus ll square let me just write it in a more expanded form so that we are 100% sure that we understand what we are writing this is the following what is l1 square l1 square is l1 the first component of it squared plus the second component of it squared so and so forth nth component of it squared right then what is l2 square similarly you change the subscript 1 by 2 and then finally you have ll which is ll first component squared okay we are in euclidean space that is why it's all pluses there is no minus l l n square 
Okay, so now let's define a new vector which I will call L E, which is um, let, let me define it first, it will be easier. Which is L, these are the components L, L, L11, L12, L1n, then it has L21 up to L2n, okay, then L L1, L, L, N. So that's the L vector, okay, in the Euclidean space. That's a new vector. So what's in the denominator? This just becomes L square. So the denominator is minus L E square, L Euclidean square minus m square, also check that m square is positive, power n. Okay, that's your denominator. Let's look at the numerator. Numerator is what? It is, um, it is just this. So it is dl11, dl12, dl13, so and so forth, dl1n, which is exactly this one. Okay, then you have dl21, dl22 uh, and so forth up to dl ln, that will be what you have here and this is the last one. Okay, so you see that what you have here in the, uh, this integral, the, the, the differentials, that is same as the following. D L N minus one. Uh, here I wanted to write N up to D L L N D N minus one L L. This is what? The way I have defined the, the new vector Le, this is D L E. But what is the total uh, dimension of this differential? It has total L such and each each of them has N. So this is N L. And th there are total N L differentials here. That is why I have written D N L L E. So the integral, the Feynman integral apart from other factors is this. It's not writing times one over minus, I will use a square bracket, minus L Euclidean square, okay, minus M square power N, okay, where M square is positive. Okay, good, so that's how um, an arbitrary Feynman integral is going to behave, there are other factors which I have vomited, um, but they do not carry the loop momenta. Now you can um, do the same thing, you can um, do the angular integrals and the radial integral. Angular integrals are not going to give you any divergences and here anyway an angular integral just separates out easily, right, because what you have here is only radial, 
it depends only on the radial part. There is no angular part in here, okay? Because just look at this two dimension. This is this is L e square. The square of the magnitude will be L e square, okay? And this does not depend on the on the theta, okay? Even if it is here, it's the same L e square. So the denominator doesn't depend on the angular variables. So the angular integral is trivial. You can okay, we'll see the angular integral later, but at least it filters out and sits outside of the radial integral and then you can do the radial integral. So this is same as angular part times the radial integral. Okay. So when does this diverge? Now uh, the reason I have uh, written it in this form is because earlier we had problems uh, because of the Minkowski space. Now I don't have any such problems. So I can just count the degree of divergence. So when does this diverge? It diverges when nL minus 2n is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. If this condition is satisfied, then it is divergent. Okay. If nL minus 2n is less than 0, then it doesn't diverge. Okay, let me remind you again, capital N is the number of propagators. Um, okay, and small n is the number of dimensions. So what does this say? Let's take um, n equal to 4 and l equal to 1. So let me write down this again. Um, okay. I will write down the expression also. So here, integral d n l l e over 2 pi n l. Did I write that earlier? Yes. Then you have 1 over minus l Euclidean square minus capital M square power n. Okay. And as I wrote just now, um, if n l minus 2 times capital N is greater than equal to 0, greater than or equal to 0, then this is UV divergent. Okay, and remember angular integrals cannot give any UV divergence. They have finite volume, okay? So, let's look at n equal to 4, meaning 4 dimension, dimensional space, which is our space, and L is equal to 1, so 1 propagator. So this condition says that you have um, something. Yeah. So this is n is four, l is one, minus two n should be greater than or equal to zero. Okay which means that n should be less than or equal to 2. Okay, and what was n? Capital N was the number of propagators. Right? So it says that if you are looking at one loop in four dimensions, if you are looking at Feynman diagrams which are uh, defined in four dimensions and it is at one loop, then that Feynman diagram is going to diverge if the number of propagators is less than 2 or equal to 2. You remember if you increase the number of propagators, the integral starts behaving nicely in the ultraviolet anyway, right? Because each time you include, have an uh, additional propagator, the, uh, it brings an additional power of 1 over k square in the denominator. So this is saying that things are bad till you are having one or two propagators. 
which you have seen already, right? This is consistent with what we have learned earlier. So if you are looking at four dimensions and at one loop, L is one, meaning one loop, and you have this, this is divergent, okay? It has one propagator. This is the case for n equal to one, one propagator. Then we have also seen that at one loop, these diagrams diverge. Okay, and these f l equal to two. Sorry, not l l uh, n equal to two. Okay, the number of propagators is two one two. So you see all these uh, diverge precisely for this reason. This is the counting which we have found. Um, so this is what is giving the divergences, and if you go to this case where this is still one loop so l equal to 1 and equal to 4 and look at this diagram this did not diverge because it has three propagators and 3 is bigger than 2 and when n is bigger than 2 then this was, this is not going to diverge so you can see that the calculation that we have done is uh, is right we have not made any mistakes because this matches uh, what we already knew so this is in phi to the fourth theory, whatever examples I have just now given. Okay, we can also look in phi cube theory and see whether it is all consistent. So in phi cube theory, let's again at L equal to one, that is one loop and let's look at D equal to four, four dimensions. This is three point vertex in phi cube theory. Okay, so that's um, how many propagators you have here, which are involved in the loop integral. There is one, it's only one, this one, this propagator, right? Not this one, this one is not involved in the loop integral. So this one, and um, this diverges because it's only one propagator, n is equal to one. How about this? This is three propagators, one loop, four dimensions. So this will be finite, right? Ultraviolet finite, and which is true because it brings six powers in the denominator. You have four powers in the uh, in the numerator. So this is also consistent with what we have found here. Okay, so. Um, we have now seen that um, the source of ultraviolet divergences and how to see them correctly uh, by doing a weak rotation. Now our next task will be to um, look at regularizations, different kinds of regularizations I will talk about in the next video. You have seen already one, the cutoff regularization. I will also talk about um, um, polyvillars and uh, dimensional regularization and then once we have done the regularization meaning how to make integrals uh, finite but dependent on the regulator we will proceed to do the renormalization okay how to remove how to subtract the infinities to get finite answers okay so see you in the next video